Matthew 28, 16 to 20, either on the A4 sheet or page 886. I'm going to read from the A4 sheet. The 11 disciples travelled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Then Jesus, coming near, said to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Going, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, We kicked this series off last week. Uh, It's a series that's looking at the four words in our slogan, our motto, our mission statement. Uh, We added one last week, the first word, gospeling. Jesus' last command to his followers is very clear. Make disciples of all nations. You can see it there in red on the overhead or on your sheet. Remember, there's nothing to recommend his followers at this point, is there? There's only 11 of them, so they're incomplete. And when they see him, literally in the Greek, they worshipped and doubted. They're an incomplete bunch of doubting worshippers. Nothing to recommend them, everything to recommend Jesus. In italics, you'll see there the two encouragements he gives them. I'm the boss of the universe. No one else has walked out of the grave, never to die again. I'm committed to you. I will never leave you. With that command and those two reassurances, he then unpacks their mission to be disciple-making disciples. You'll see it there on the sheet in blue or up there in yellow. They are to be going and baptising and teaching. Remember, a disciple is a wholehearted student follower of Jesus and they make more disciples by sharing the good news of Jesus. There's no one else like him who lived the life they couldn't live, who died death for them, who rose from the grave to show that there was no rival to him. He had beaten sin for them. So as they go right throughout the world sharing that good news, people meet Jesus and become wholehearted student followers of him. We are a gospeling mob. Today we're going to look at one part of that, And we're going to look at being a baptising mob. And we're going to learn that we gather together. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thank you for being able to gather here. Uh, Peace and security, uh, comfort, uh, with much to give you thanks for. Uh, Father, we're gathered as a diverse group. We've just been reminded that we are a body. Some of us have come from weeks that are full with joy. Some of us have come from weeks that have been really hard work. Uh, Some of us have come this morning distracted and tired and worn out. Some of us have come really enthusiastic. Father, you've gathered us. Uh, This is your mob, and we give you thanks for your grace in doing that. Father, help us to be a people who hear your word, know you more deeply, and proclaim you most clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, baptizing. Well, we're there in verse 19. I'm at point two on the outline. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, baptizing is a Greek word, funnily enough, given the New Testament's written in Greek. It uh, covers a really broad range of activities in the Bible and in the culture around. Uh, if you go to 2 Kings chapter 5, when Naaman dips in the Jordan River, he's been baptized. It describes what John did to Jesus in Matthew 3. We'll come to that in a moment. When you get to Mark chapter 7, it talks about washing, the washing of plates and bowls in preparation for a meal. Uh, When you get to Luke 11, it's applied to a ritual washing where you only wash the hands and the feet, no other part of the body. It's used of what took place for the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts And what took place with Paul and the whole household of the Philippian jailer and in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the household of Stephanus. When you get to something like 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 2, you can be baptised in a cloud. 
and also in the sea. I'm led to understand that in the wider Greek culture, it can mean anything from a drip or a dribble through to the sinking of a whole ship. And the baptisms we have in the New Testament are quite diverse, aren't they? And when you get to Jesus' baptism in Matthew chapter 3, it appears to be full immersion through to no description of what happens with the Philippian jailer and the household of Stephanus. Now, in that sense, I think God's given us a pretty big paddock where we can be godly disciples and still differ on the specifics of the method, the moment, and the means. In fact, when you get to what Jesus says here, he doesn't describe any of those, does he? In fact, the teaching about Jesus comes after the baptism. What we do know is that it was practised by John the Baptist to prepare people for the coming of Jesus. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Then people from Jerusalem, all Judea, all the vicinity of the Jordan were flocking to him. They were baptised by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. It's a baptism to get ready for something, to express something about your preparation. God's king's coming, get ready. In fact, a little later, God's king comes. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptised by him. But John tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptised by you, and yet you've come to me. Jesus answered him, allow it for now, because this is the way for us to fulfil all righteousness. Then he allowed him to be baptised. After Jesus was baptised, he went up immediately from the water. The heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, coming down on him. And there came a voice from heaven. This is my beloved son. I take delight in him. I think it's a really helpful moment for us to think about the baptism that Jesus is talking about. Jesus didn't need to be baptised so he could repent of his sins. Jesus didn't need to be baptised to get ready for his own coming. In fact, John seems to make that thing, I, I don't need to be baptising you, you need to baptise me. And then Jesus says, no, what, we've got to do this. It's necessary for me to be baptised. Why is that? I think it's necessary for two reasons. I think in his baptism, Jesus is saying who his mob is. I'm with all those others getting baptised. That's my community. Those sinful humans... I'm with them. They are my mob. They are my community. Jesus is one of us. That's the first reason. I think the second reason is there at the end. There's a public statement of his identity, isn't there? Did you pick that up? Not only is he truly human, he's one of us, he's truly God. Do you see who speaks? who descends? Do you see that at that moment the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit are in community now and forever? And Jesus is saying, that's my identity. That's my community. This is my identity. Jesus himself never baptised anyone. We're told that in John's Gospel. And so it's really remarkable that at the end of his life here on earth, His final command involves baptising. But I think when we go back to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, he's talking about what happened at his baptism. Look there again at verse 19, Matthew 28. Make disciples of all nations, baptising them in or into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, This baptism is into something. It's not a physical movement, is it? It's a relational movement. Uh, It's not a movement in time and space, but a movement in terms of your community. They're baptised into a new community. And that community is God himself. Have you ever thought about that? God himself is a community on his own. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Hanging out together 
forever. And a disciple is brought into that mob, into that community. I want you just to think about that for a moment. Baptised into God. Oh, we're going to share a meal in a moment, aren't we? John Calvin describes the Lord's Supper as sitting down to dinner with God himself. We're going to be expressing who we are. We're going to express our community and our identity. You see, that's what I think is going on here. Uh, The baptising command of Jesus is a public statement, an effective symbol that disciples are now in community with who? With God himself. And God is always in community. That's who he is. In fact, when that baptism takes place and that community is expressed, your identity is made public, isn't it? Where's your life hidden? With Jesus. Remember the good life? Your sins are forgiven. All of his perfection is now yours. So when Jesus is commanding baptism, he's talking about the baptism he underwent, a public and effective statement of community and identity. Community with God himself and identity as someone whose life is hidden with Jesus, who's inseparable from him. In fact, that's how it's used in the rest of the New Testament when you look at the specific moments. Uh, We've got something like this from Romans 6.4. Therefore, we were buried who? With him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life. We're connected to Jesus. That's where our identity is. Colossians 2 verse 12, having been buried with who? With, With Jesus in baptism. You're also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Where's your identity and community? It's with Jesus and with God. Baptism in 1 Peter 3, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. You're completely perfect through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism is a public statement that you are in community with God, that your identity is with Jesus, and that means, as Seamus helped us see, that you are now connected to everyone else in the same boat. (laughs) Everyone else who is so connected with God, you are now connected with them. You are a community gathered. You are a community gathered. Now, That's not a new development in the Bible. I'm at point three on the outline. Uh, That's not a new development in the Bible. In fact, it's the outworking of God's very clear desire, design and plan. Uh, If you look back over the whole Bible, and don't worry, in this point we're going to do that very quickly. If you look back over the whole Bible, you'll see a very rich and very tawdry history. It's really rich because of God. It's really tawdry because of us. God's always been clear that his desire is to live with his mom, to hang out with them, to be gathered with them. It's there in the Garden of Eden, isn't it? Genesis chapter 3, when God came to walk in the cool of the evening in the garden. God wants to hang out with his mob. He wants to be gathered with them. Uh, In Exodus 25 verse 8, Leviticus 26 verse 11, God says very clearly, Exodus 25 verse 8, Leviticus 26 verse 11, God says very clearly, I want to live with you. I want to hang out with you. I want to be gathered with you. And yet, what happens in Genesis 3? There's the ugly bit. Sin breaks such a gathering. It tears down the dwelling. The attitude and action that says, I'm God and God's not. And so God again commits his eternal desire through the family of Abraham. Genesis 12, 1 to 3. I'm going to hang out with you guys. I'm going to be gathered with you. And so God gathers them together at Mount Sinai. Exodus 19, 1 to 8, Deuteronomy 4, verse 10. That, that's the first church, Deuteronomy 4, 10. Gathered together there with God as he's already saved them. What happens a little after that in Numbers 14? They walk around the desert for 40 years, don't they? Because what's broken in again? What's torn the house down? What's broken up the gathering? That thing called sin. 
They come into that land that God promised after 40 years of wandering. And what do they build smack bang in the middle of their capital? A massive big house. That's what the temple is. A public statement that God wants to dwell with his people, gathered together with them. 1 Kings chapter 8. And then sin comes in. Sin breaks it up. It tears down the house, literally. And they're removed from hanging out with God. 2 Kings 17, Ezekiel 11. Do you get the pattern? I want to dwell with you. I want to be gathered with you. I want to live with you. Hang on, God. I can do a better job than you. Separation. House torn down. Finally, in John chapter 1, verse 14, Jesus sets up a tent. God himself sets up a tent called flesh and comes and lives with people. God himself did this so that humans could come back to him. Humans could live with him. Humans could be part of God's family, God's community, God's gathering. And when Jesus does this, this is what he says he is doing. And I also say to you that you're Peter and on this rock I will build my... Church, my gathering, and not even the forces of hell will overcome it. How did Jesus do that? Well, we heard about that last week, didn't we? That's that good news thing. (laughs) That thing that kept breaking up the gathering, that thing that kept tearing down the house, that thing that kept God and people separate. God himself said, I'll deal with it. I'll deal with sin. Jesus lived, died, and rose so that sin could be beaten and God could hang with his mob. God could be gathered with them. Remember those words we started with? Remember those words we began with? Instead, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels in festive gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven, to God who is the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous people made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the sprinkled blood, which says better things than the blood of Abel. We we did a whole series on this, didn't we? It's called church. That's what the gathering's called. God's people gathered in one place at one time to fellowship with God. Remember two weeks ago, our eternal hope, Revelation 21, where God says, I'm going to live with you. There'll be no more pain or death. There's no more sin. That's where we're going in the good life. Uh, Let me just summarise before we finish. Making disciples, wholehearted student followers of Jesus, means baptising them into the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. That is a public and effective symbol that disciples are in a new community with a new identity. Community with God, identity, life is hidden in Jesus. That community extends to everyone else connected to God that way. That's always been God's desire to gather and live with his mob. That's always been his plan and sin kept ripping down the tent until God himself came and in Jesus Christ dealt with sin. So God can gather with his mob, with his disciples, That's what they'll do forever. It's called church. Now, when you think about that, that image that Seamus showed us helps us remember all those other images God gives for this in the New Testament. Uh, There's the body, there's the household, there's the building, the vine, the temple and the bride. None of them work when you cut them up or break them down, do they? It's not a vine. It's not a bride, it's not a body, it's not a household, it's not a building, it's not a temple if they don't gather. They're broken. God's people are a gathered gathered and gathering people. They're gathered with God and the picture of that is baptism because of Jesus. They're gathered to each other and you notice there in the last part of verse 20, they're gathered with Jesus forever. I'm with you always to the end of the age. Now let me reassure you, I have point four on the outline. Let me reassure you, uh, that's been a fairly dense couple of minutes, hasn't it? 
We've summarised the whole Bible in one point. We've covered the nature of God as a community in and of himself and we've looked at the nature of being a disciple. A disciple, a wholehearted student follower of Jesus gathers with God and his people. So why is it so important? Let me give you three reasons to finish with. It's important firstly because this is who we are. Our identity and our community are described as being gathered with God. (laughs) We're a gathering people. We are gathered into God and with each other. To be a disciple of Jesus is to be gathered, to be brought into God and with each other. That's who we are. We can't avoid it. The second reason is this is what we will be forever. We've got this now. Ephesians 2.6, you're already seated in heaven. Hebrews chapter 12, you're already in church in heaven. That's what we are, that's where we're going, that's what we'll do. To be gathered, to dwell with God, that's our hope forever. Now, to not gather, to not gather would be a denial of that, wouldn't it? In fact, it would be an abuse of that. Why would we expect to do something forever, gathering, if we refuse to do it now? The third reason is connected with this passage, and I want to read it carefully and slowly for you. This is from Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he's inaugurated for us, through the curtain that is his flesh, his tent. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful and let us Be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works. Not staying away from our gatherings or meetings, as some habitually do, but encouraging each other all the more as you see the day drawing near. Did you notice how that works? We we can gather with God. We, We can get access to God. Jesus has opened a way for us to come before God. Remember that, his body and blood? So we can come into the presence of God. We are baptised into the community of God. That is who we are. Let us then draw near. Don't avoid gathering. (laughs) Come to God. That's where your life is hidden. That's where your identity is. If that's who we are, if that's who we are, then what does our dabbling with church say about God? and the community we're in? What does it say when we choose alternatives over gathering? Be they sport or family or work? What does that say publicly about who we are? How does that disciple those around us? How does that teach them our children, our spouses, our families and our friends, how does that teach them that we can approach God if we don't even want to gather with him? It's central to being a disciple because it is a commitment of concern. Do you see that one there in verse 24? Let us be concerned about one another. How how will you show that? By showing up. (laughs) Week in, week out not staying away from our meetings as some habitually do. To show up shows our concern for each other as disciples, a desire to spur one another on to love and good deeds. It says something to our children as we get ready. It speaks to the lonely and the isolated and the struggling who turn up each week to be encouraged. It speaks to the widower, the single person and the widowed It speaks to the child who comes. We're concerned about you. We're disciples together. And thirdly, we gather because we have something to confess. Do you see that middle one there in verse 33? 
Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering. We are making a public statement about what we believe when we gather. What's discipled us? What's claimed our hearts and our minds and our footsteps, our desires and our devotion when we say, I'm going to go and be gathered because God has already gathered me. To be a disciple is to be a gatherer. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you for Jesus' last words. Thank you for his goodness in the command to make disciples. Please help us to be wholehearted student followers of Jesus who gather in community with you and each other. Father, help us not to downplay the symbol of baptism and what it proclaims publicly. In Jesus' name, amen. Any questions? Uh, we'll go. We'll go from the back to the full. Elsie and then Phil. Um, That's a really good question, isn't it? Do you have to be baptized to be a disciple? And why don't you open your Bibles to Romans chapter ten, verse nine? Open your Bibles to Romans chapter ten, verse nine. Uh, if you're too slow with that, I'll try and do it up the front. We'll see how we go. Romans chapter ten, verse nine. What's that, Phil? A thousand and five. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. All right. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Now, that's really important. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Notice that the saviour bit is assumed. If he's Lord, he can be your saviour. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What is crucial? Come and meet Jesus, okay? If you have met Jesus, Jesus is saying baptism is a public statement of who you are. Do you need baptism to be saved? No. If you are saved or part of a household that is under salvation, should you be baptised? Yes. Okay? So it's not necessary, but it's the ordinary way we do things. Does that make sense, Elsie? Terrific. Phil? Uh, our Bible study got the point that the three disciples were to gather together, but then the question arose, if you're physically prevented from gathering because you're a prisoner of the faith, yeah. are you not a disciple or are you lesser in any way? Yeah, a really good question. So if, if there is some physical reason you, are, you can't gather, are you a disciple? Uh, really helpful to remember Hebrews 12. So if I believe that Jesus is Lord and raised from the dead, what am I? I'm saved, which means in Hebrews 12, what am I already in? The gathering, eternally. Ephesians 2, 6, you're already seated at the table. Eternally, God in his mercy will sustain you to that point. So there are plenty of periods where Paul couldn't go to church. In fact, he writes the letter to the Ephesians from jail. Uh, So uh, again, do you need to go to church to be saved? No. If you are saved, should you be at church unless there is some really, really good reason that stops you? Yeah, you should be there. Is jail a good enough reason? Yeah, because jail is actually a public statement that you are following Jesus as Lord and suffering the consequences. So uh, is it a necessity? No. Is it ordinarily the way God has designed people? Yes. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? Lloyd? Uh, I think, uh, so Lloyd's question is, this the only way that you could apply church to this gathering? Where does the word church come from? It comes from the Greek word ecclesia. Uh, What does that word mean? It's the gathered people who can make a decision. If you are not there when they're gathered, you are not part of the ecclesia. That's the way the word works. Okay, so we get that a number of times in the New Testament. Uh, Acts chapter 16 is one of the classics when the ecclesia of Ephesus goes to strangle Paul. <laughs> uh, they're the mob. Okay, so the expectation is the ecclesia doesn't exist unless you are all as sufficiently gathered as you can be. And that's what we dealt with in that sermon series, wasn't it, when we talked about that. Uh, that's the model for eternity. 
Are there any non-Christians in heaven? No. Are there any Christians who are not in heaven? No, not eternally. Okay. All the people are there. They're all gathered in one place at one time with God. So pulling out of that is a Bible study group church. No, I don't think it is, but it's a means to gather to support your membership of the church. Is youth group church? No, it's not. But it's a means we've created to support your gathering in the church. And so my understanding, there there are people who disagree with me on this. That's that's one of the broadness of, of, of God's kindness. But I think ecclesia is a very particular word God's chosen. And when you track it through the Bible, it is God's people gathered in one place at one time. So Deuteronomy 4 verse 10, Mount Sinai. Revelation 21, 1 to 8, heaven. In between Hebrews 12, 18 to 24, already there. And so I think Jesus is saying, if you are a person of God, you gather for church. Come back at me later on if you've got any other questions about that. Yeah. Any other questions? Let me just make one other, let me just make two final points. Don't confuse a denomination with a church. Denominations are man made structures. We use them to organize how we do stuff (laughs) and the territory we're in. A denomination is not a church. Okay. A church is gathered when they meet around Jesus Christ as he's revealed faithfully in God's word. Okay, all of the people there, all of the people there, that's the first thing. Second, how are you saved? Jesus, 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 time and time again. Don't go anywhere but Jesus to have your sins forgiven. 